Good evening, everyone. And once again, welcome. I hope you uh, were able to pick up a packet with uh, the uh, information that will be covered tonight. Uh, I'm so excited to see faces in this room, and I know that many will be receiving this information either tonight in person in the auditorium um, or through the website. The recording and the PowerPoint presentation will be posted on the website, our Google site, our guidance Google site, and um, and any questions, of course, and follow-ups will be uh, directed to us, but specifically to Mrs. Walsh, who's our college advisor, school counselor extraordinaire, who's uh, an amazing resource. So tonight, uh, welcome class of 2024. This is your night, students and parents. I am also a parent of a class of 2024 student in my home district, so woohoo, we're in, in, in this together, and so we are gonna be doing just fine, I hope. Um, so tonight, we're gonna give you uh, a great deal of information. And I always say, either you're going to be super excited and empowered with all this information, or you're going to be uh, completely overwhelmed. But once again, I'm Jeanette Alomia, Director of Guidance for the Huntington Schools. I supervise K through 12, our school counseling program um, across the uh, district and our staff. Um, and we are very happy to uh, provide you with this information. And so for tonight's agenda, um, we will be talking about the post-secondary planning process and the reason why we actually are shifting from a college workshop to more of a post-secondary planning topic is because we know that our students uh, go to uh, head to different options, different outcomes after uh, high school. So we know that uh, students, the majority of our students, about 86% of our last uh, class of 2023 are heading to two and four year institutions. Um, and then the rest are heading to either military, uh, they're doing uh, trades, uh, competitive apprenticeships and trades. They're taking a gap year because they're doing amazing humanitarian things. They're working they're uh, building businesses so we are very excited that and proud of every single student's uh, post-secondary outcome and so uh, tonight we're going to talk about your, um, the whole process specifically about the college admissions process your responsibility students seniors what you need to know what you need to do um, the college office and the Google Classroom and that platform and that communication uh, that is key to be on. Uh, Naviance, or actually we need to call it the right way, Naviance, um, and the college admissions criteria and procedures, financial aid and scholarships, and special consideration. I will also like to inform you that this uh, presentation will be posted in Spanish. Bienvenidos a la clase del 2024. Esta información también será divulgada a ustedes y solicitada a ustedes en español. Si tiene, tiene alguna pregunta, tenemos sus, las consejeras bilingües, la cual pueden también conectarse con la señora Walsh, que es la consejera de, de la oficina de, de, de universidad y de, de planificación postsecundaria. Así que bienvenidos a todos. After the special considerations, we will go into a Q&A. And so, in, with regards to college admissions and uh, the post-secondary planning, we know that we are still living uh, the residual effects of COVID-19. And so, if you have recently viewed your uh, student's transcript, or if you recently received a letter from me stating about special appeals, it may or may not uh, apply to your child. However, there has, has been uh, concessions and accommodations with regards to regents, exams, uh, exemptions and special appeals since uh, the school year of 2019-2020. So that can be discussed uh, individually with your respective school counselors if you have a question about special appeals and regents exemptions. With regards to the post-secondary options and outcomes, every student has options. Do not think that you have a uh, you know, specific institution in mind. Some students are like, I'm just gonna go, and I'm just saying, quoting, I'm just gonna go to a two-year university. There are options out there. Again, it's all about empowering yourself with the opportunity, with the information, and having a dialogue with not only your counselor, but also your 
other counselor who is uh, a specialist in the college admissions process. Um, it is not where you go, but what you do when you get there. Many folks, they go to uh, a, an, institution, an institution, first school, that may not be their first choice. That's their stepping stone, that's their starting point. However, at the end, when they get their bachelor's, their master's, their even higher uh, level of education, uh, that's when it really matters because it's relevant to your career, right? And so it doesn't matter the, uh, the journey, it's getting there. Um, and every, everyone's path will be unique. Please do not try to compare yourselves with, you know, your neighbor or your friends. Like I said, everyone has skills, strengths, different paths, different likes, different interests. And so please, uh, I know it sometimes can be hard, especially when you're in a social gathering, to try to, you know, compare, to discuss maybe test scores, GPAs, where your child is uh, applying. Every, 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 every child's uh, journey is, is unique. Um, I would de definitely say that or organization is key. Um, putting things into, I like to put things in Google spreadsheets. When I meet with my son, I have everything like, you know, schedule. And oh my gosh, he's like, why, why my, my mom is, my mom, <laughs> why isn't she uh, a professional in another field? But uh, definitely organizing, uh, keeping a visual schedule, using your Google calendar or your regular, you know, old school paper, you know, book calendar, keeping lists, keeping your college search uh, lists in hand and having it all documented in one piece of sheet or documentation as a Google Sheet or an Excel spreadsheet can really alleviate a great deal of stress. Um, our role in the process is we understand that we have a leg up because we're always informed and with regards to college admissions trends, you know, financial aid and scholarships. And we understand that as professionals, and we're here to serve you, we understand that we are um, uh, in, in immersed with this information. However, this is, again, your journey as families. You're the ones uh, that would make that decision. We will give you advice. We will give you information. But at the end of the day, you parents, guardians, families, as well as students, you're the ones making that very important decision. Um, and you're the ones writing that deposit check and, and making that commitment when it, when it goes on before May 1st. So students, I see some students here in the auditorium. So here are your responsibilities. And one of the things that I tell my son, Sebastian, is to own the, the process. And even though I tell him and I suggest and I uh, guide him myself, I tell my son, this is your journey. I had my journey. I did it pretty much all by myself as a first generation college attendee and graduate. Um, and so I try to give them some room and some space to own this process. Uh, some of us here in this room are, have gone to college. As you know, the college admissions process and college itself has changed and evolved over the years. And so your process, uh, which happened a few years back, is, can be quite, quite different than your child's process. So let your child own the process. Um, have you, now these questions to really think about, and this can be your checklist. Um, have you, students, have you verified the accuracy of your transcript? Every, every week, pretty much, or every 10 days, I post an updated transcript on the uh, eSchool student and parent portal. I have been uh, taking the liberty to recently do that, even though I, I will officially send out a communication about you formally reviewing your unofficial transcript and viewing for accuracy, right, if there are any discrepancies. And Mrs. Walsh should talk about, you know, the transcript approval form, the records release form, and how those are intertwined. But the most uh, important aspect right now is for you to verify that all those grades that of your course grades as well as your regions exams that everything that's on the transcript is accurate because that's the document that we'll be sending we will be sending out from um, the college office uh, via Navians to the colleges as well as scholarship programs so it's very important that students you verify the accuracy of your transcript the other thing is, as juniors, uh, last year we, we had our a very, very exciting uh, program with 
um, uh, Penn State and SUNY Oswego that we talked about, you know, the essay, and we had our, you know, junior uh, student parent night where you had a chance to talk to your, your, your counselor that evening. That was last spring. And so we advise you to start streamlining um, and researching schools and, and streamlining the list of colleges. So students, uh, what steps have you taken to research schools and complete a, uh, the applications on time? Um, as you know, and I sent a Parent Square email back in um, August 1st, the Common App went live back then in August 1st, so it's, um, and we had about 100 uh, participants register to take the Common App boot camp in August that Mrs. Walsh uh, amazingly ran, as well as the college uh, re uh, essay reviews um, where uh, college representatives came in to, to uh, review and provide feedback on the essay. So that, that is, uh, you know, uh, another responsibility of the student to start the Common App if you haven't done so and complete it. Um, and also, have you started working on your college essay? More than ever, the essay is a very important component of the Common App or the college application, only because over hundreds and hundreds of schools are test optional or test blind. And so now colleges are weighing in on your story, right, on that essay, on your uh, letters of recommendation, and of course, of your, your academic profile, i.e. your GPA, your cumulative GPA, as well as uh, sometimes test scores for, for merit-based scholarships and whatnot. So that is uh, one of the things that I definitely uh, would suggest also, and Mrs. Walsh will provide some support and offer that as well um, in terms of the college essay. Student athletes, if we have any student athletes, have you registered with the NCAA? So as of July, we, we recommend uh, for our seniors to have uh, registered with the NCAA if you are considering to play a, uh, for a Division I or Division II uh, college or university. Uh, communicate and monitor, it, this is very important. Communication is key. Uh, always, always, always get, uh, keep your uh, school counselor, whether it's Mr. Lashen, Ms. Brunoni, Ms. Hernandez, Ms. Marcelin, Ms. Bonilla, Ms. Alvallero, Ms. Vargas, um, and, and absolutely Mrs. Walsh, keep, keep them in the loop of your college admissions or post-secondary planning and the steps that you have completed. Everyone join the class of 2024 Remind Group. If you haven't done so, you would go to the Remind app. It's the same app that you had joined for the text of the day. Mr. Cusack sends a text of the day every morning at 7 a.m. And so your dedicated code is at Hunt 2024. And parents, I also urge you and encourage you to join that Remind because we do post many, many, many notifications from, again, scholarship opportunities to colleges coming in to visit us, which we're very excited because they're coming in in person, but we're also offering that opportunity virtually. Um, have you made an appointment with Mrs. Walsh? I think that a lot of uh, the class of 2024 has either met with Mrs. Walsh or will be meeting with Mrs. Walsh within the next uh, few weeks. Do you know if your colleges require uh, or recommend a supplemental essay? And so that is embedded in the Common App. And Mrs. Walsh, I'm not gonna take your, your space and your time, but in terms of the supplemental, I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm gonna tell you what I tell Sebastian, my son, if they say it's recommended, it's required. So we do recommend that you, student, uh, complete that supplemental essay. And if it's, it's a short essay, it could be anywhere between two to two, 250 words. So I would definitely uh, submit, write and submit that uh, supplemental essay. Do you know how to utilize Naviance to request teacher letters of recommendation? So Naviance is not just to talk about uh, and to view profiles of each college and, com and college admissions criteria, but that's the tool where you would be requesting uh, your teachers for letters of recommendation. And once again, if you need uh, some help with that, w Mrs. Walsh would be going over that, and as well as your school counselor is very knowledgeable about that. Um, de dates and deadlines. You, uh, once you have entered your colleges on the Common App, you will see those deadlines. Are you applying early action? early decision, regular decision, and what are those deadlines? If you have an October 15 deadline, 
definitely uh, try to touch base with Mrs. Walsh, um, you know, after tonight, but like right away. And I want you to follow up with the college offices on all admissions decisions. Um, we dedicate a lot of time and effort and we really care about all of you students and we care about your, um, where you're heading next year, but we also care about knowing where you got in and where you unfortunately did not get in, where you got waitlisted, who offer you a scholarship. We would love to uh, hear from you, not only because we care, but also uh, as an administrator, I collect that, this data and I definitely um, uh, look at the data to see how, ways that we can improve our, our outcomes, uh, especially with post-secondary outcomes. Okay, so now I'm gonna pause. I will be available at the end of the program with, uh, if you have any questions, you can feel free to approach me at the end. And without further ado, here is Mrs. Walsh. Hi everyone, I'm Mrs. Walsh. Many of you know me already. Uh, it's great to look into the audience and see familiar faces. Thank you so much for coming down. I know it's not always so easy, working parents and all, and got things going on, but this is really important, and so I appreciate your time. Uh, for those of you whose friends aren't able to be here tonight, seniors, this will be recorded, as Mrs. Alamea said. The presentation will be posted, and all the handouts that uh, we have at the tables up in the front, those will be posted as well. Uh, but you are here, so let's make the most of it and hopefully have a conversation out of this. Any questions that you have, um, if you have them during the presentation, I think we're a small enough group that you can feel free to raise your hands and ask. Um, but really what we want to discuss tonight is post-secondary planning and the actual application process. Um, I met with many of the current seniors during their junior year, uh, many of their families as well, and so I think most students have a good sense of where they need to be at this point. Um, there are certainly students who are still researching, and there are students on the other side of the spectrum who are actually ready to apply. But I think the large majority are kind of like right in the middle. And that's where the college office comes in. Um, I am a school counselor. I've been a school counselor for 22 years. Uh, but my sort of specialty is in the college admissions process. Uh, we have a, a big team of counselors here, and everybody's got you know, kind of different roles. Uh, we have a counselor who's in charge of scholarships. We'll talk about that. We have a counselor who's in charge of the Wilson Tech program, and so on and so forth. But I live in the college office, which is room 120, right across from the library. Uh, and this is a space for students that's dedicated to post-secondary planning. Not just college planning, but we do have students who are looking into military options. We have students who are looking into uh, work options. We have students who are looking into taking a little bit of time off and maybe doing some volunteering, traveling, etc. So my office is sort of like one-stop shopping. We sit down, we discuss, we put together some plans. Uh, Mrs. Catalano is my partner in crime over there. She's our wonderful secretary, whom many of you uh, will meet when you walk right into the office or when you're calling with questions. She's the one who's going to field everything. Um, she's fantastic. Um, and once you get into the college office, you'll see tons of information. You'll see a work area for students uh, to sit down, get onto the computers, uh, a quiet space sometimes in between periods to sit and work on college essays. Um, it is also a room where we host college visits. Um, so we have a lot going on there. And if there's any student in here who hasn't been down yet, please make sure you do. Um, a couple of the handouts that we had up at the top there, um, one of them I want to point out is called our Friday Flyer. And that is the yellow bulletin. Every Friday, this is posted on the district website in English and in Spanish. And this is kind of your what to know uh, guide, information about scholarships, upcoming college visits, uh, college fairs, SATs, ACTs, anything having to do with that, that next phase of, of life for you guys. So you want to be on the lookout for this. You can always stop in the college office and pick up a copy. Students, this is also posted to the college office Google Classroom, and again, like I said, on, right on the college website. We discuss all sorts of different things, and like I said, in the college office, from working on Naviance to questions about financial aid and scholarships, um, and as I said, to college fairs. I do want to talk about our amazing college visits this year. So 
prior to COVID, all of our colleges used to visit here in person. And then we, of course, had COVID. And so all of our college visits were virtual. But now this year, we're bringing back the schools. And we're so excited. So three periods per day and some scheduled after school hours, we have admissions counselors coming to meet with students. You can find a full list of the colleges posted right in the Friday flyer. Also, students can find this information on their Naviance accounts, as well as on the College Office Google Classroom. Students are more than welcome to come down, learn a little bit about a school that they were maybe thinking about applying to, or heard of, or maybe their cousin goes to, or whatever, wherever they are in the process. This is a moment for a student to take 40 minutes out of their day to sit with an admissions counselor, learn a little bit more about their school, help the school learn a little bit more about them, ask some questions about majors, scholarships, uh, financial aid, the application process, application deadlines, et cetera. So I say to students, this, this list is updated often. What you see here in the flyer, it may be updated in another two or three days or so. So the best place to find the most up-to-date information on these college visits would be on the student and parent Naviance accounts, as well as on the College Office Google Classroom, or just stop by my office and you can take a look at the list. The College Office Google Classroom, this is your hub of all things college. So any document a student might look for in the college office, let's say they have to leave school early, they're sick, they're not in school one day, whatnot, all the resources that a student would find in person, they can obtain on the College Office Google Classroom. It's broken up into different sections. We've got a section uh, that will list all of our Friday flyers, a section all about Naviance, a section all about the common application, uh, a section all about scholarships, and, and you see the list right here. Students were sent an invitation to join the College Office Google Classroom. So most students are actually on this already, but for those that aren't, the, the code is up here, as you can see, LBL3KRC. Students know how to join these Google Classrooms, so just, you know, parents, guardians, touch base with your kids, make sure they're on it, uh, but chances are they are. Have them bounce around a little bit, take a look at the different sections of it so that they can familiarize yourself, themselves. And if you can sit down with them as well, you'll see all the videos and how-tos and guides right there. I say to students, make sure you have your notifications turned on, just like with Remind, because you want to be in the know when we have new information to share. So when I post something new to the classroom, a student will get a notification, whether it's a message about an evening workshop or a college coming to visit, the student will get immediate notification and then they can plan accordingly. The Google Classroom and Naviance work sort of hand in hand. Naviance, another great resource for students for career planning, college planning, scholarship planning. Um, all of our students have access through the Clever platform. Parents and guardians, you have access as well through your own unique codes. If you haven't been on Naviance in a while, parents, guardians, and you're not so sure of your access code, please get in touch with either me or your child's counselor, and we can certainly get you back on board. Having both students and parents involved in Naviance makes for a real happy process because we're all on the same page. It's actually through Naviance that students will research colleges, scholarships, et cetera, but also it's through Naviance that letters of recommendation and high school transcripts are submitted to colleges. So when I say to students, you know, you've got to really, really be on board with Naviance this year, more than you ever have, I mean that with, with truth, because it's through Naviance that students can really own this process even more in terms of keeping track of their letters of recommendation, were they requested correctly, were they sent out correctly, transcripts, and so on. So it's, it's really like the glue that ties everything together. And we'll talk more about you know, the procedures in a little bit, but what I just want to impress upon you is that the College Office Google Classroom and Naviance are two sites that we want to make sure that your, your children are on in terms of college planning, post-secondary planning, and then the actual application process. So when it comes to college admission, this is probably uh, no surprise. We've got documents that are required. We've got a transcript. We've got letters of recommendation. Um, in some cases, we have essays that are required, perhaps an audition or a portfolio. Uh, big differences between the admissions criteria between two-year schools and four-year schools. 
And you know, everybody's path is unique. Everybody's looking for something different. Some students might start at a two-year school and transfer. Some students might start at a four-year school and transfer to something closer to home, whatnot. We want to prepare for all sorts of scenarios. So Mrs. Alamia was uh, mentioning before about the transcripts. The transcripts will be verified within the next couple of weeks. I'm going to go through the pieces of a college application momentarily so we can kind of get a better sense of what we mean by a full transcript, how to request letters of recommendation, and so on. But before we do that, let's talk about some, some timelines. When students are applying to their colleges, they've got options in terms of how they will apply. You've probably heard of these terms before, regular decision, early decision, rolling admission, et cetera. But just to kind of give you a, a kind of an on the ground feel of what this means, I want to give you some examples. So a regular decision school has a hard deadline of usually around January 1st. The student has up until January 1st to apply. January 2nd or so, that's when the college will be starting to look at the applications. So applying in September or October or, <clears throat> excuse me, December to a regular admission school, it doesn't matter. Yes, early bird, you know, takes the stress away and we don't want to wait until the very last minute, but it's a hard deadline. You can apply any time before that deadline, you cannot apply after that deadline. Early action, this is non-binding, student applies early, they hear back from the college early. Early action deadlines um, can range from at the earliest October 15th through about November 15th. So a student is applying about two months before the regular decision deadline. So we're looking at regular decision deadlines in January, early about two months prior. So when a student applies two months prior, they are also going to hear back from that school with an admissions decision earlier. There are many, many big southern public colleges that have October 15th deadlines. University of North Carolina, University of South Carolina, Georgia, Clemson, and then new this school year, Stony Brook has an early action deadline of October 15th. So you have to be careful. If your school has early action and you're prepared to submit your application early, get it done, get it out of the way. Now we're looking at some earlier deadlines that are gonna be coming up fairly soon. This is non-binding. If you get in, that's great, but you don't have to go. You have time in the spring months to make that decision. You have until May 1st to put down a freshman deposit. So non-binding. Early decision, this is binding. And this is something that you certainly don't wanna take lightly. Students can apply to one school through this program. In applying early decision, you are applying early. You are going to find out early, and you are demonstrating 100% commitment to this college. If I am admitted, I will enroll. So it's something to really you know, think about it backwards, forwards, and inside out. Is this college the best fit for you? Is it the best location, the best major, the best everything for you personally? And if a student can't say with 100% certainty that yes, this school is the best bet for me, then applying early decision probably isn't the best way to go. So you really do have to think about that because it is binding. Single choice, restrictive early action. This is non-binding, but there are restrictions as to how many other colleges, if any, a student might be allowed to apply to early. Not too many schools have this program, so you may not even see it, but it is non-binding. And then we have rolling admission. Now, rolling admission means there's no deadline. The early bird truly does get the worm. So on an ongoing basis, the college reads the applications, makes admissions decisions, and churns out admissions um, packages. So if a student were to apply in, say, September, October or so, they'd find out by Thanksgiving or so if they've been admitted. However, the student is not locked into attending that school. They've found out earlier. Something to think about is that rolling admission can go on for a full application cycle. So I don't want any students being fooled into thinking that it's okay to wait until February, March, April, May to apply. Now college might still be accepting applications, but I will guarantee you at that point, most of the scholarships are gone. So with a rolling admission school, you want to apply as soon as possible. So I know there's a lot of information here, um, but 
you know, Mrs. Elamio brought up a great point before about staying organized. And this is something that I urge our students to put onto your spreadsheets. As you're making a list of schools that you think you want to apply to, you want to make sure you're capturing specific information, certainly about major size, location, cost, scholarships, and whatnot. But now we're looking at application deadlines, and we want to be sure that you are meeting those deadlines, um, that we're not you know, missing anything. So we sit down together and we discuss this. We make a plan. We make sure that you have options on your list, colleges, programs, things that you're thinking about that make sense for you and, and, and would work for you and your family. Um, some students, as I said in the beginning, have a full list of schools they're already excited about. And some students might be applying to some colleges and considering maybe taking a gap year. We can work through all of it. We have some students that are going to be applying to colleges and maybe if I don't go to school, maybe I'll enlist. So we talk about all different sorts of scenarios. So in order to schedule an appointment in the college office where we sit down for the period, we go through um, the, the process with your child, they're going to come on into the college office or they can scan the QR code here to fill out an appointment request form. Students will need to fill out this packet, which I have up front. And, and again, lots of familiar faces. I'm sure many students already did this. This is the appraising myself packet. This packet is essentially a student's ticket into the college office. So it's with this packet that I am going to get to know the students to then provide students with resources. So if a student fills out the packet, you know, I'm going to ask them about their interests and what are the, some of the things that they enjoy doing, their hobbies, um, what are their post-secondary plans, are they thinking about a two-year school, a four-year school, a college for engineering, a college with a marching band. I can then provide that student with very pointed information specific to what your child is looking for. So the packet starts the process. Students who have already filled this out do not need to do this again simply requesting an appointment either in the college office or scanning the QR code here, that will work. Mrs. Catalano, uh, as I mentioned, the college office secretary, she will reach out, she will schedule the appointments. If it doesn't work, you come, the student come on in, just let us know, we'll try and, and find uh, you know, a period of time that will work for all of us to sit down. We're going to discuss, again, individual college applications. We'll talk together about the common application or perhaps the coalition application. Um, and it's in the college office that I mean to be a resource for the kids, to give them the things that they don't know about. This packet gives me great insight so I can say, why don't you think about this? Why don't you think about that? The college application is a pretty big document. Uh, but I say document in jest because everything is electronic. So students are applying to their schools online uh, we'll talk about how that happens and the different kinds of application platforms. And then there are some items that we're going to send and that the student's going to send. So it really is, it's, it's a group effort. There's me sending information out, there's the student sending information out, then we have the teacher sending information out. And we have forms, don't worry, that tie all of it together. So some of these items here are going to be required. Certainly a transcript, a high school profile. High school profile is Huntington's resume. So it's basically a document that helps admissions counselors get to know Huntington and where your students, where your children go to school. The classes that are offered, the programs that are available, Mrs. Alamia and I are updating it now with you know, updated information. Um, the uh, colleges our students have been admitted to, our post students' post-secondary plans. So again, it's meant to give an admissions counselor a good sense of the student's educational environment. They'll receive the transcript, but the profile helps the college read that transcript. Okay, I see you had these courses available to you at your high school. Okay, and this is what you took. Oh, there's an internship program at the high school. You're taking an internship. Let me learn a little bit more about that. They use the profile to get to know us. Teacher recommendations, of course. Counselor recommendation comes from me. Um, a mid-year report, that is where perhaps the college asks for a first semester report card from a student. Uh, activity resume, essay, supplemental essays, as Mrs. Alamia was referring to, uh, and perhaps an early decision agreement, um, and then certainly a final report. Final report, that's way, way down the road. Uh, just so you know, when your students graduate and they let us know what their plans will be for life after high school, if they're attending college, the college they're attending will need to receive a final transcript from us indicating graduation. So I know that's way down the road, but that's what that's what the final report means. 
Yes. Okay, so the question was about activity resume. So an activity resume is a resume for a high school student. It lists activities, co-curricular within the high school, outside of the high school, community service, work experiences, honors and awards. Many students have been building their resume through Naviance. It's a great tool for, again, college career planning. Some college applications do allow students to upload a resume, but not all. The common application, it's, it's a mixed bag. There may be some schools that participate in the common application that allow students to upload a resume and others may not. But for all schools that use the common app, and I'll talk about this in a minute, the students do have to type in their activities. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. Having a resume together is something that we encourage all students to do, not just for college applications, but also for scholarship applications for summer job opportunities, uh, but it will encompass everything 9th through 12th that a student's been involved in. Uh, the students that I met with last year probably already have a sample activity resume. Students can come on into my office and I have hard copies. Also, there's a sample on the College Office Google Classroom that you can take a look at. Is that good? Okay. So let's talk about college application procedures. Um, I'm going to get into the three application types. Um, that would be the common application, the coalition application, and there's institutional applications. The term common application, most of you are familiar with. Um, coalition application, I'm thinking not too many people have heard of that one. Uh, and institutional applications are where a student would apply to the particular college through their website. So let's go through these, you know, kind of one, of it, one at a time. Uh, but all applications are going to be looking for these items right here. Um, transcripts, teacher recommendations, counselor recommendations, other relevant documents that we just discussed before. We're going to be using Naviance to send out a lot of information. Students are going to be using their application platform to send out a lot of information. And eventually it all marries together and the application is complete on the college end. The coalition application is a platform that's used by a little over 150 colleges. It provides a nice, easy, uniform way for students to submit college applications. Um, the, the problem I see is that there's not too many schools that use it relative to the amount of colleges here in the US. So there's over 4,000 colleges, only 150 use the coalition application. Chances are very good students won't even use this, and that's because there's a lot of overlap with the common application. The common application, you have probably heard this platform before. Over a thousand colleges use this one. Big schools, small schools, close to home, further away. Colleges may give students options in terms of how they would like to apply. You could apply using the common application, the coalition application, or the institutional application. So for example, if you were to apply to Binghamton University, you could apply through the SUNY website, or the coalition application, or the common application. I encourage students to use the common application wherever possible, because it will make your lives a whole lot easier. One platform, one, one password, one time filling out the activities, one section to fill out personal profile information, so you're not reinventing or working on this process over and over and over again. So when a student has a choice to use one of those three platforms, I'm going to say always go with the common application. Sometimes it's not possible. Georgetown, for instance, the CUNY system, for instance, you have to apply to those schools through their websites. So it can happen that a school does not participate with common application, but if they do, this is the way I would go. Um, it's very user friendly. Most students have started this already. It takes time. It's very tedious. It's not rocket science. But if you could sit down for a good 45 minutes, couple, every couple days or so, you'll get through it in no time. And moms, dads, parents, guardians, um, you definitely want to sit down with your kids while they're filling this out. There's information that they're just not, not going to have at hand. Um, and so, kind of getting this done and over with in a time frame that gives you enough 
time to review it, go over everything, make sure it's all correct. Um, that's what I would suggest that we do. So various application deadlines with the common application, various application fees. The schools will differ in selectivity, so we're going to have some very selective schools that use the common application, and your children will have some safer schools that use the common application. One main essay as well. The common application may have supplemental essays. That's what Mrs. Alameo is referring to. So there are going to be some schools that use the common app that will say, you know, we need a little bit more information. We want to know why are you applying to our school? We want to know why have you decided to pursue such and such major? So when a student begins the common application and they start to identify some schools that they'd like to apply to using that platform, you can begin to capture not only application deadlines and application fees, but any additional requirements. So I say to students, put into your common app all the schools that you know you're applying to and the ones that you're just thinking about at this point. This is a good idea. Even if you're thinking about this particular school, maybe they become more uh, prominent on your list. Well, when's that application due? Is there anything extra? Do I have to request another letter of recommendation? At least you would know ahead of time what the application process looks like. This application is only online. There's no paper copy. Um, and what I have in, uh, in this packet, about three pages in, is information that students will need when they're filling out their Common App. There's a section in the Common Application about, about you know, your kids, about where they live, where they go to school, whatnot. There's a section for them to upload their essay, to type in their activities. And they're also gonna ask some information that's specific to Huntington, about our class size, date of graduation, our grading scale, et cetera. So in this packet, you'll find that information. Yep, that's all here. You, if you sit down with this, kind of as you're working on common application in the education section, this will answer all those questions that are specific to Huntington, okay? Now the common application works with Naviance. This is the beauty of Naviance. And there's a special process called the common application Naviance matching process. And so it essentially allows the two systems to talk to each other. Let me just back up again. We use Naviance to send out transcripts and letters of recommendation. Students apply through the common application, right? So I need to make sure the teachers need to be able to see the colleges a student's applying to on the Naviance account so we can send materials out. So this common application Naviance account matching process requires students to sign what we call the FERPA waiver. Now, FERPA, as you might be familiar with this, is Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And basically, what the common application in the colleges want students to do is waive their right to withhold and read their letters of recommendation. I know that sounds kind of scary. Letters of recommendation are confidential. The colleges want to know students aren't hiding anything, that they haven't tampered with those letters. They want to make sure that when a student asks a teacher to write a letter of recommendation, that that teacher has the freedom to write a letter that is truthful, honest, and of course, always supportive. So the common application is gonna show students, and you'll see on the slide right here, where to sign this FERPA agreement. So when a teacher sees that a student has, and actually I say a college, sees that a student has signed this FERPA agreement, the college knows that, you know what, this student is asking the right teacher. This student has thought about this process and is asking those folks who know them well, who are willing to write the most supportive letter that they possibly can for the student. And the student hasn't influenced that letter either, saying, can you please leave this out or put this in or et cetera. When a student is matching their Naviance and Common Application accounts, and I will, I know this is you know, kind of, it looks a little, a little, little funny here, like where'd I get all this? Um, in the packet, this one right here, with this front page right here, it says records release. The second page of this actually discusses the common application Naviance account matching process. But it's a very simple process that allows the colleges that are listed on the common application to transfer over to Naviance. So that I can then log in and eventually send out transcripts 
and teachers can log in and eventually send out letters of recommendation, and I can then send out a letter of recommendation as well. Eventually, as I said, we will see the list of schools that a student's applying to, and that's how we know it's, it's go time. I do want to just talk about this real quick, though. So this page right here, this is called the records release form. It's not enough for a student to walk into the college office and say, hey, Mrs. Walsh, I'm applying to Farmingdale. No, we need a release form so that I then have permission to send the transcript and letter of recommendation to that college. So up front, the packet gave you one release form. You can come into the college office. Students can grab as many as they like. One per college is required. And this is how I know, all right, I'm gonna take this transcript that was approved. Remember, Mrs. Alamia is gonna be sending out communication to approve the transcript. And I'm gonna be able to send it to Farmingdale, to Old Westbury, to Stony Brook, to Marist, whatever schools the student's applying to. So students will fill out one of these per college. Now I have up here letters of recommendation. When I get this back, that's how I know it's time to get my letter of recommendation done for your kids. I am writing a counselor letter of recommendation. My letter of recommendation is holistic in nature. I'm talking about your students. I'm talking about the things that they're involved in, what they enjoy doing. This packet kind of goes back to that, this appraising myself, helps me get to know your students better. So students don't have to request a letter of recommendation from me. That's automatic. When I get this, that's essentially the request. Students will need to request teacher letters of recommendation. Most students spoke with two teachers last spring. Very informal. Now is the time for students to touch base with those teachers, make sure they're still willing to write these letters, and then request a letter of recommendation through Naviance. The second page in this packet is a recommendation request form. Students can obtain these in the college office and also on the college office Google Classroom. And the reverse, speaks about how a student can request these recommendations through Naviance. All recommendation requests need to be sent through Naviance. Teacher uploads a letter, submits it to the college directly. The letters don't come to me, they go directly from the teacher to the school. So as I'm sitting down with students and kind of going through this process with them individually, we're talking about did you request these letters of recommendation? Did you speak with your teachers? When a student's unsure about how to request through Naviance, we sit down, we go through Naviance together. But the point is, I need students to finalize these letters, who, whom they're asking, and touch base with those teachers sooner than later to be sure that the teacher is still willing to write the letter, has the time to write the letter, and eventually gets the link to write the letter. So this is just a screenshot of what, not, how, what Naviance looks like when a student is going to request a letter of recommendation. Um, the student sees a drop down of, of all their teachers' names here in the building. Uh, the student has all their colleges listed right below. So they can actually see, all right, I'm gonna ask this teacher to send my letter to these colleges. They click submit, teacher gets an email, they can upload that letter. Now something I wanna just make mention of is that there are 359 seniors, there are over 100 faculty members. Some faculty members are asked to write 20, 30 letters of recommendation. I am writing quite a bit more. We need time to do this. And so the teachers and I need 15 school days notice prior to an application deadline in order to process materials, get those letters out, and make sure that we are fine-tuning everything, uh, making sure that there's no issues and no errors. The records release form, that first page in the packet here, on the reverse, actually has a calendar. So for students who have an October 15th deadline, your teacher recommendation requests and the records release form need to be submitted by September 21st. Now that's coming up soon. But I wanna let you know something. Students don't need to apply, click submit, in order to request a letter of recommendation, in order to submit a, recommend, a records release form. 
Students have until their deadlines to apply. I just say to students, I just need to know about it. I need to know in advance that you're working towards an October 15th deadline. You're working towards a November 1st deadline. You're working towards a January 1st deadline. Just because a student has a college listed in their Naviance account, just because a student has a college listed on their common application or a student you know, gives me a records release form for a particular college, doesn't mean they have to apply to that school. It's okay. You're in control of what schools you want to apply to. Naviance will only send materials to a college that a student has applied to. So that prevents a school from getting your children's transcripts and recommendations if they never apply. And that's the matching process with Naviance and Common Application and adding additional colleges into Naviance. When a student gives me a release form and I submit documents, it's gonna go into the Naviance bubble <laughs> until your student applies. So if they never apply to Binghamton, but I've hit submit, never goes to Binghamton. So I often say to my students, give me release forms for all the schools that you're thinking of right now. Just let me prepare in case. I don't want you to think of something last minute and then forget to bring in the forms. Just you tell me the schools that are on your mind and if you decide not to apply, that's okay. We just don't want any last minute situations. SATs, this is a real hot topic right now. Um, on this page right here, you're just gonna see some of the official websites and phone numbers to access score reports from the SAT, ACT, AP. Uh, down below, we see where it says self-reported and then fairtest.org. So there are many colleges that have um, test optional policies, test flexible policies, and that's gonna actually be the next slide. But I do want to kind of discuss those two pieces at the bottom, self-reported and fair test. Self-reporting means exactly what it says. A student is reporting their test scores. So for those of you that have had um, time to sit down and work on the common application, you're gonna see a section that says testing. Students can fill that out, they can put in their test scores for the SAT, for the ACT, AP scores, whatnot. There's another section in the common application, in the colleges section where a student can say, all right, for this school, I'd like my test scores sent. For this school, I don't want them sent. So a student self-reporting their scores on common application doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get to the college. The student's in control whether or not they want those scores visible. That's just a function of the common application and you'll see as you work through this really what I mean by that once you start building a college list. Fair Test is a nonprofit that collects information from admissions counselors all over the U.S. and many abroad um, and has a list of colleges that are test optional. Many of whom have been test optional for, you know, decades, way before the pandemic. But the list has grown exponentially, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so if you're a student who's thinking about going test optional, uh, you may want to take a look at Fair Test um, just to get an overview of all the different schools that participate. You could certainly go you know, college website to website to website, but this houses a, you know, a database of all the information. So should I send my test scores? This is a conversation best had between the student and the admissions counselor. This is a conversation that can happen in the college office when we have admissions counselors coming to visit at a college fair. Students certainly don't need to reveal their scores if they don't want to, but the, the, the job of the student is to find out, is it in my best interest to send scores? So asking the colleges about the ranges of scores that admitted students are sending over is going to be helpful. Test optional, student has a choice of whether or not they want to send those scores over. Completely up to the student. Test blind means that the college will not consider scores anyway. Don't send them to us. And test flexible means that there are multiple pathways through which a student could apply with testing. Um, so for many, many years, NYU has had a test flexible policy where a student could send SAT scores or AP scores, or years ago when there were SAT subject tests, they could send those over. It was up to the student to decide how to best represent themselves. Let's talk about some of the big systems here. Uh, we've got SUNY, and on the next slide we have CUNY. So we are all familiar with SUNY, 64 campuses, uh, big schools, small schools, as, as, as close to home as Farmingdale, as far away as Buffalo and Plattsburgh. 
Um, SUNY has varying uh, admissions requirements. We've got our two-year schools, we've got all the way up to our university centers where students can earn PhDs. SUNY's test policy, I'm just gonna read this out because I know it's kind of hard to see. Um, this was just released recently. SUNY has temporarily suspended SAT, ACT testing requirements for students applying for admission to a SUNY bachelor's degree granting college. You may now decide whether or not to include your scores for admission consideration at each college to which you apply. If you believe your scores are an accurate representation of your ability, SUNY colleges can consider them along with all other materials in your application file. If you think your scores do not represent your abilities, SUNY colleges can holistically evaluate your application without considering them. So when you're applying test optional, you're applying you with your transcript, your letters of recommendation, your essay, and your resume, four components. When you're applying with your test scores, now there's a fifth. So having the conversation with the admissions counselors, is it in my best interest to send scores, is something I strongly encourage. CUNY, we've heard of CUNY, the city, the city public system. 14 senior colleges, an amazing honors program as well. Um, we have quite a few students that will apply and enroll in CUNY schools. CUNY does not use the common application, as I said before. They have their own website that they'll use. Um, CUNY is, uh, has a general freshman admissions deadline of February 1st. Beyond that is rolling admission. In terms of their SAT policy, CUNY has revised its testing policy to test optional, effective fall 2023 through spring 2025. First year applicants can choose whether to submit SAT or ACT exam scores as a part of their application. The admissions decision will be based primarily on a student's academic preparation in high school, including overall GPA, course grades, and academic rigor of their high school curriculum. Students should carefully consider whether they would like to send their test scores. If a student has a particularly strong academic record and believes that their standardized exam scores do not reflect their full potential, they may elect not to send SAT or ACT scores. If a student feels that standardized test scores improve their overall academic record, we invite them to send the scores. The absence of SAT or ACT exam scores cannot be used to deny a student admission. So when a student, or when a college is test optional, the basis behind this is that they want to give students the option to decide how to package themselves up. What components are going to make me a more viable candidate? And if my test scores can enhance my application, then CUNY, SUNY, other test optional schools, they want you to send them over. And if they're not going to be helpful, maybe the scores are below that middle 50%, and what that middle 50% is, is something that is um, advertised on the college websites, you can obtain in conversation with admissions counselors. That's gonna help students figure out, should I or shouldn't I? That records release form, I discussed that before. Remember, we go back to this form right here. Basically gives me information about the college that the student's applying to, the deadline that we're working with. Did the student use the common application? Did they use uh, the coalition application? Are they applying to a CUNY school and applying directly through the CUNY website? And as I said, the records release form is due 15 school days before the application deadline. You do not need to apply 15 school days before the application deadline unless you want to, unless you are ready to go. I wouldn't say apply the day of the deadline, of course, but um, let's be sure that you give yourself plenty of time. Um, I do remember years ago with Hurricane or Superstorm Sandy. Remember that happened to Halloween? That was a uh, day before the uh, November 1st deadlines. No one could get on their computers. The common application was crashed. So students who were waiting to the last minute, they were in a very stressful situation. Fortunately, you know, colleges all over the country knew what was going on, so they gave students you know, a little bit of a grace period. But we don't ever wanna get stuck in a situation like that again for you know, uh, weather-related reasons or personal reasons. So really, you wanna time this out the right way, give yourself enough time to sit, go through everything, and make sure it's all accurate. Financial aid, of course, this is a, a, a big, big topic. Um, how are we gonna pay for this? So, many of you have heard of, of the FAFSA before. That's the free application for federal student aid. What you may not know is that FAFSA has been, um, the federal government has been revamping FAFSA for the past three or four years or so. 
and they are ready to unveil their simplified FAFSA in December. So those of you that have older children or yourselves, you've gone through this process of applying for financial aid, you'll likely remember that the FAFSA was available October 1st in previous years. This year, it's available December. We don't know if it's the 1st or the 15th or the 30th. We haven't received guidance on that just yet. The colleges have not received information for the federal government other than December is when this will be available. Up in the front, I had a couple of handouts about the FAFSA simplification. Um, for those of you that have filled this out before, you remember this is a very long, consuming process. FAFSA simplification reduces the number of questions from a, over 100 questions to about 30. Uh, so it's, it, it will certainly make everyone's lives a lot easier, but we're gonna have to wait it out for another couple of months or so until it's available. We do have a financial aid night scheduled for January 16th. We have a FAFSA completion night scheduled for January 30th. So you know, do mark, mark your calendars. We know by then the FAFSA will be out. Um, so let's, let's plan for those. The FAFSA is the form that's used to distribute federal financial aid. So whether you're a student in California or New York or Minnesota or anywhere in the US, you're gonna be filling out the FAFSA to apply for federal financial aid. New York State has their own financial aid program. That's called the TAP program, Tuition Assistance Program. The FAFSA needs to be submitted first and then the TAP is available, so we can't do anything with this one either just yet. Um, and the third financial aid form uh, is called the CSS Profile. The CSS Profile is used by about 400 colleges and universities uh, across the US to distribute institutional aid. So it has nothing to do with federal funding, has nothing to do with state funding. This is institutional aid, so it's gift aid. Um, colleges that have typically very active alumni associations and benefactors and donors that give back, give back, give back to their schools. These are the colleges that will use the CSS profile. Um, if not all of the 400, nearly all of them will be private colleges. That is income-based. Merit scholarships are a different story. Merit scholarships uh, can be awarded on the basis of grades, volunteering, um, involvement in different local organizations. Uh, oftentimes, uh, parents, if you are um, in, in a union or a local, there are scholarship opportunities available for your children. Scholarships can be awarded on, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's just thousands of scholarships out there. It's finding the scholarships, that's the tricky part. But we provide lots of assistance here. So we do have a scholarship coordinator, that's Ms. Bonilla, and she has a, a quarterly scholarship newsletter that is posted onto the district website, onto the College Office Google Classroom. Um, it is available on paper format in all the guidance offices and in the college office, and that's put together uh, pretty regularly. Naviance is a great scholarship resource. In the FAF and the um, Friday Flyer, there's information here about financial aid and scholarships. So if students are willing to do the digging, there is money out there. And I always say, don't, don't just look at the scholarships for $20,000. Those ones are really hard to get. Let's look for the $1,000 scholarships, the $500 scholarships. Let's fill out a lot of those applications because that will add up. And it's often the case that college essays can be used for scholarship application essays. So you wanna save everything you've written, guys, whether it's your main college essay or your supplements because you might be able to use those for scholarship applications later on down the road. Certainly, special considerations. You know, the, this, this process of planning for life after high school isn't a one-size-fits-all. We have some students that are going to be looking into fine and performing arts programs who might need portfolios, who might need auditions. Uh, we have student athletes who are maybe thinking about maybe a Division I or II school, maybe club field hockey. Maybe they're not totally sure. We're gonna talk about that. Um, Support services, all colleges from coast to coast provide support programs. They may differ from college to college to college, but support is available at every school. So these types of special considerations and more are some of the things that we discuss when we sit down together to make sure that we've got a plan that you uh, students feel comfortable with, that you as, as parents and guardians feel comfortable with as well. A Couple things. 
Next week, I'm going to be pushing into all the 12th grade ELA classes. So I am going to be taking one period from your child next week, going into their English class and discussing the college application process. A uh, little bit of this, but a bit more information from their, their side. Uh, I'm gonna kind of get a, take some polls and see where they're at with their research and how many people have worked on the common application and kind of gives me a sense of what I need to do next with them. I am also going to be camping out in the library uh, September 27th through October 3rd for open periods where students can come on down, sit and work on their applications, ask questions. Uh, we can do the common application Naviance matching process, really anything. You want me to double check your essay? Of course, I'm happy to do that. So there's a lot of support kind of scheduled into the next two weeks. But in addition to that, the college office door is always open. Students can always come in and ask questions. Sometimes a student will text me through your mind and say, Mrs. Walsh, what is, what is this all about? I say, okay, yeah, no problem. Let me get, I'll get back to you. We'll figure this out together. Um, I have three kids. I know that they think that they can do everything all themselves. I say to them often, I'm not a mind reader, so you have to tell me what's going on. So when a student has a question, they have to ask. I have a lot of information up here. I don't know exactly what each student needs. But if you come to me, you come to the college office, you ask questions, I will hopefully be able to give you answers to those burning questions that you have and make things easier for you. That's the goal. Senior year is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be exciting. There's a lot going on from you know, the bonfire and certainly um, all those great things that happen in the spring, like field day and obviously graduation. And planning for your future shouldn't have to be a scary, overwhelming event. My job is to try and make that easier for you. So. Make sure you ask questions, make sure you stop by, um, and we can make this a real collaborative effort. Okay, so since we're a small group, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah? Okay, so outside letters of recommendation. So there's kind of a, a, a few ways to answer this question. So number one, we wanna make sure that we're following college application protocol. The common application will list how many letters of recommendation are required, how many are recommended, and so on. So on a very general, general uh, 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 scale, my letter of recommendation is always required. My letter of recommendation is not part of, of the, the number. It's a counselor letter, so it's not part of the teacher package. It's always gonna go. The common application will say, we want two letters of recommendation from teachers, and maybe we'll accept an additional letter of recommendation. It depends on the schools. So that's something that we can certainly discuss in person, because we, don't want it to, we wanna make sure we're following the college procedures. There are forms in the college office and on the college office Google Classroom that I've distributed to students already. These are called appraising, appraisal forms. Uh, you'll probably remember them as yellow and green. These are forms that students can hand out to other folks who know them very well to help me write my letter of recommendation. So while a coach might write an amazing letter of recommendation, we don't want to supplant that and take away the math teacher for the coach letter of recommendation. My letter can include information from coaches, from club advisors. So there's you know, a couple of ways to go about doing this. Um, with outside recommendations, you just want to be sure that you're not kind of exceeding the requirement that the college is looking for. Because they're reading thousands and thousands of applications. They're not gonna have time to read all the letters of recommendation that you know, a student could potentially have sent over. So we wanna send over the best ones. So when following their procedures, that's kind of the, the, the rule of thumb. Okay. Sure, sure. So the question is really about communicating and developing relationships with admissions counselors. So the college admissions counselors that visit us here at Huntington High School, whether it's through the individual college visits or the virtual visits or even our mini college fair that we're holding in October, those are the admissions counselors that are our regional representatives. They read our applications. So it is a good idea 
for a student to meet with an admissions counselor at a college that they're planning on applying to, especially if it's on home base. So I say to students, take a look at the list of schools, they can come on into the college office, they can sign up for any of those visits, and that's how they are beginning to demonstrate their interest with, the, uh, with that college. An email here or there is certainly acceptable, certainly. This application, the college application, is the one opportunity that the student has to share who they are with the college. Yes, the college essay can get personal, right, and can share a, a, a glimpse into who they are, not just as a student, but as a person. But conversation can do that as well in a more intimate level. So emails, communicating, um, visiting the colleges, having a personal tour, all those things can demonstrate interest. And when an admissions counselor goes to make that final decision, looking at their spreadsheet to say, all right, I visited Huntington High School on October 3rd, and this student visited me, oh, okay, I'm gonna remember that. Because they do that, they do that. Not every college, but most of them do. In fact, um, what's happening now is, an, Parents, if you, if you applied to college you know, years ago, you probably remember filling out the little postcards where you'd put your name and your address and all that, and then the colleges would mail you things. Well, now the colleges come in with QR codes. <laughs> a student scans it, they fill a little form, and now they're in their database. So it's very easy for a student to begin this process and initiate. When a student has questions about admissions, about SAT requirements, test optional, things like that, the student can absolutely get in touch with our, the regional admissions counselor. And that's information that's very easy to find right on the college website. All the student has to do is go onto the admissions page uh, in the top search bar, type in admissions counselors, and you'll see the links to get into uh, the list of admissions folks and then determine who is our regional person. So it's pretty, it's fairly simple. Okay, so the answer is yes, you can, but it's tricky to do so. Um, once you submit your common application, it is locked for that particular school. Now students apply to colleges one at a time using Common App. It's not a uh, click send and now you're applying to seven schools and paying $500 in application fees. You apply one at a time and decide, all right, I've got my list of schools and today I'm gonna submit the application to Stony Brook. Tomorrow I'm gonna to submit the application to Hofstra, and so on and so forth. So if a student submitted that first application and their essay is posted in there and they realized, you know what, oh, I made a typo, or maybe I just have a different idea I wanna share, you could certainly take out that essay and put in a new essay for additional colleges. But you have to be very careful with that. Um, that would not be the, the, the time to plug in an essay that's specific to here's why I'm applying to that particular college. Colleges may have supplements, and that is where a student would say, here's why I'm, I'm applying to Hofstra, here's why I'm applying as an engineering major, here's why I'm applying as this, that, the other thing. So the main essay is really meant to be the same across all the common application schools. It's the supplements that are going to be different based on the colleges that the student's applying to. You may be applying to schools that don't even require supplements. Not every school needs them, but some will, so that's why I think it's a good idea to put all the schools into the common application, and then you can look at the application fees, the application deadlines, and any additional requirements. Additional requirements um, you know, could be above and beyond what you were thinking. There are some schools that will ask for students to self-report their transcripts. And we talked about self-reporting a little bit before, but self-reporting your transcript is a big process. And that's where a student actually will have to sit down with their transcript and plug in all the courses that they've taken and all the grades they've earned over the previous four years. So it's very, very tedious. So understanding what these application requirements, additional pieces that are required, uh, understanding that ahead of time is very, very important. Now, once a student applies, they click Submit, they will receive an email that will say, thank you so much for applying. Um, it is now time for you to create a portal account on our website. And so it's then going to be through Hofstra's website, through Maris, through that college's website where students will keep track of additional information. Transcript was received November 1st, check. Letters of recommendation were received November 2nd, check. Financial aid application was received, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So 
checking email regularly is huge, 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 huge. Some students have created their own personal college email addresses just so that you can filter all the college information right to that email. Um, you know, if, if, if any of you students are like my kids, you're getting emails from Nike, from uh, Best Buy, from Sephora, from Ulta, from all these different places, and it's just a bunch of junk, and it's very easy to lose the important messages in them. We don't want to lose these important messages. So maybe creating a personal email that's just for college would be a good idea. Obviously not required, but maybe something to think about. If you're someone who doesn't check your email regularly, or when you do, you've got to unsubscribe to a million lists, then maybe a new email address is in order. Yes? So, uh, it's all done by October 15th. So this is why the records release form and the recommendation requests need to be made submitted 15 school days prior, so we can meet the student's application deadline as well. Correct, correct. So a student makes the request through Naviance, the teacher receives a link, the teacher then uploads the letter and sends it out. So the letters uh, and the transcript as long as we are given 15 school days ahead of notice, we can have everything out by that deadline. I have to say, in doing this for you know, over 20 years, we've never missed a deadline. We have, you know, I'm, I'm really a stickler about this, we've got to get this in 15 days ahead of time so that there's no issues. Now, the turnaround time is not 15 school days, I'll tell you. It's usually within about 48 hours I can push everything out. But God forbid there's a Hurricane Sandy or there's you know, some catastrophe somewhere or maybe a teacher is having some trouble with Naviance. I just need to be sure that we've got a buffer just in case. Now, as I said before, when I hit submit on Naviance, it's gonna stay in the Naviance cloud until your student applies. So in, in the process where a student gives me a release form 15 school days ahead of time, I may, you know, quote, submit materials two days later. That's probably before your child applies. That's okay. Everything's going to sit in the Naviance bubble until your child applies, and then everything is matched together. That's an internal process that happens between common application and Naviance or the institutional application and Naviance. Naviance delivers. Yes, that I take care of. So when I get that release form, I'm gonna send it through Naviance. But back to what Mrs. Alamia said earlier about that transcript, she's gonna send communication in you know, another week and a half or so, instructing students and families to go onto the portal, take a look at the transcript, verify its accuracy. Within the letter that Mrs. Alamia sends, there will be a link to a Google form. And that Google form is the transcript approval form where basically a student and parent sign off that either A, everything on this transcript is nice and clean, or B, there's a problem. And then we investigate. I talk to the counselor, we figure out what the issue is. Did a student drop a class, did they add a class? You know, is, it, what, what's the issue here? So before I send a transcript out, it has to be approved, and I will not send anything out without a transcript, uh, or I'm sorry, a records release form. So you know, we're not sitting down together and clicking send at the same time. Uh, but it's through Naviance and Common Application that these pieces are matched together. So it takes, it takes you know, a little bit of time, but we're, we have this process kind of down pat to make sure that we've accounted for any sort of incidentals. Yes, so when a student requests letters of recommendation, on Naviance, you're going to see um, the status. The status will say either uh, requested or submitted. So when it says submitted, that means, of course, the teacher has sent that letter of recommendation over. So it's through Naviance that the student will see when that was sent out. Common application will also update on the student side to show that that letter of recommendation was sent out. And then the portal that the student will create on that college website, that is where he'll find the checklist this was received, this was received, this was received, et cetera. Mm -hmm. 
The transcript is sent out once it's approved. So if it's approved with an SA on it, a special appeal, then that's how the transcript will be sent out. If the transcript is not ready to be sent out because there's a discrepancy, then we will just hold that transcript until then. So it depends on what the, the, the situation is, but we can certainly discuss that you know, individually. So once a student family approves the transcript and I receive the release form, that's when it's go time. So don't approve a transcript unless it's ready to be approved. <laughs> Well, thanks everybody. This is a nice small little group, uh, but make sure you let your friends and uh, neighbors know that this will be re this is re being recorded and that'll be posted onto the website within maybe a couple hours or so. <laughs> Have a great night. Thanks for coming.